Welcome back to Computer Music. We will uh, get started today, and uh, hopefully, right off the bat, my my some of my goal. One of my goals for today is to get you actually making sound with Max and MSP, because I, I think the longer we delay that, the the more frustrated you'll get. Basically, in terms of, I'm supposed to be making sound in this computer music class, so um, I don't want to hold you back any any uh, further in that regard. Um, but just to kind of recap where we are, okay, uh, you did have a chapter summary that was due Monday. I've read through those. You should see grades up there for those now. It's a simple, you know, two, one, or zero, basically. So uh, and I did offer a few comments to people. Uh, in general, they were good. Uh, in specifics, if you spent the bulk of your time summarizing rather than reacting and, and talking about things that you want to explore more, think of, I think, I actually changed the the. the the, let's see, can I get over there? No. Um, on Blackboard, I actually changed the name of this because it used to say reading summaries. I changed it to reading reflections because I think reflecting is more what I want out of these writing assignments rather than summarizing, okay? Um, obviously, you need to mention what specific thing from the reading you're reacting to, you're reflecting on, uh, and that's where summary comes into play. But I do want you to push more toward re the reflection side of things rather than the summarizing side of things. Um, and I gotta, um, let me get off of this, yeah. Okay. Um, tutorials started. Uh, anybody been able to start the tutorials? One, two, okay. Good. Uh, we're four days into my 30 day challenge, I guess we would call it. Uh, so you should, if you've done two a day, you should be about eight of them done. Um, if not, uh, start ramping this up basically so that you can get these done here in the first month. Uh, it will certainly help you going forward if you get through uh, about, I think I said about 25, uh, let's just split the difference. If you get through about 25 tutorials on the Mac side and 25 tutorials on the on the MSP side, you'll be in good shape. Uh, there are more than that on both sides basically, but um, those, are, those are kind of the core topics that will help you build more advanced patches, okay? Um, and then after today, uh, the last thing we'll do today is I'll, I'll sign you to your groups, um, and you will be working in your groups from here till um, I think it's it's two. Well, let's see, two weeks from Thursday is when your first presentation is. Okay, um, that is intentional on my part to kind of get you moving quickly right from the start. Okay. Uh, I don't expect perfection the first time around, but the closer you can get to it, the better you can get. Uh, the better you'll get over the f iterations of these projects, basically. Okay, um, it is part and parcel with my goals for this class for you to be able to tackle big projects in medium length time frames, basically two, three weeks. Okay, um, that's really uh, the intention of having this this project schedule the way it is. Okay, um, so you'll be yeah you'll know your group by the end of the day, and you'll be I guess strategizing, starting to have meetings with them as far as how you want to move forward on your research topic for this first project, okay? Um, but I said uh, I want to make a patch, let's make a patch, okay? Uh, go ahead and launch Max. But this is the patch that we will be making. I actually threw it into the slide, okay? It's a very simple patch that will allow us to, uh, I don't know, should I tell you what it will do or should I, should we discover what it will do? I'm trying to think. Surprise. Surprise? Okay. Well, I mean, you see things up here. Uh, are there any words you recognize that might lead, might, well, if you had to hypothesize what this would do, based on some of the words you see up on the screen, any guesses? No? It's okay if there's not. I just was kind of curious if, like, how much information is conveyed by the patch itself. Okay. Um, okay. So we're gonna we're gonna build this patch. Okay, and we'll build it uh, semi quickly. Let's see here. I'm gonna move this over to this screen, and I'm gonna launch Max here. Uh, let me hide this so that we. Oh, where did Max go? There it is. Okay. I don't want Max on that screen. Congestion. Okay. So you've launched Max. Do you have this window, this Max, the window that says Max at the top of it? I'm seeing a few screens that does not have that. Okay. 
how do we get this window up? This is a this is an important window, the max window. This is where uh, you can post messages. Uh, it's kind of like the console output if you're familiar with other programming environments. Um, if not, it's also a way for Max to send you messages. So rather than pop-up menus coming up all the time telling you what's going on with Max, they'll actually post messages into this window, the Max window. Uh, you can get to it by going to the window menu. No, yeah, there it is, the Max window. It also has a keystroke associated with it, Apple M. Okay, so that's actually what we're where the Max window lives if it disappears for you. Okay, um, go ahead and. Uh, Put that up on the screen. If you have something like this, let's see, I'm looking at what I see on the screen. Some of you have this, correct? Uh, and some of you have just clicked on the tab here so that you have the max window on the side. You can do that as well. So th this max tab and this max window will display the same thing, okay? So there's no difference between these. It's just a matter of where you find them, okay? So we can send messages uh, to that, uh, let me see, what's the easiest way to do that? Uh, well, I, I don't want to get sidetracked in that, but you, we'll, we'll send some messages to the Max window in a little bit. There's also at the top, if you've got this, um, if you don't have the sidebar, typically people that are new to Max end up liking the sidebar because it's handy to have things right there on the side of the screen. Um, and if you click on the Explorer tab, okay, you'll see a ready-made selection of objects, okay? Things that we will be using, okay? Um, and we're basically gonna be using, um, well, let's start with an object box. So if you click and drag an object over to the white area, it'll set up an object box for you, okay? And who remembers from last time, What? how do I tell uh, the name of the object? What's What's, What's special about what we type into the uh, box, basically? Spacing. Yeah, there's a space between whatever the object name is and any arguments, right? Okay. So anything we start typing right here, the fact that we've got a blinking cursor should be a computer signal, right, that you're supposed to start typing in here, okay? That's basically what the blinking cursor means, okay? So if I type in here, let's type in the word metro, okay? Uh, before you click outside of it, you'll notice there's a lot of information that comes up on the screen beneath the object if you type in the word metro. And it, yeah, actually, I didn't have to get very far. Right? I just had an M-E, and there's this nice menu that pops up that shows uh, text completion. So if you kind of remember the name of an object, if you just start typing it in, Max is going to give you a list of guesses as far as what it might be. And... In, in addition to the name of the object, it gives you a description of what it does. Okay, so I've said that I want the, uh, the metro object. What does it say next to metro there? Somebody read that for me. Output a bang message at regular intervals. Okay, so bang. I, did I mention bang last time? What is bang? Who remembers? Yeah, Mike. Yeah, it's an object to tell it to do something, okay? We're gonna, it's a reserved word in Max, okay? You can't name things bang. You shouldn't save your patch as bang. Uh, you should also shouldn't save your, your patch as the name of an object because it will actually uh, do uh, funky things because it'll try to actually use your patch rather than the object. So if you save your patch as metro, that's not a good idea either. So, um, but especially bang because it's a reserved word that means do something, okay? Now, we're going to be outputting this message, do something, at regular intervals. Why would we want to do it at regular intervals in a computer music class? Yeah. Sustain a note. Sustain a note, okay. What are some other things that we do at regular intervals in music? Rhythms. Rhythms, right? Okay. The pulse of music happens at a regular interval. Basically, when we hear pulse in music, it's just simply that that, that beat that's happening at a regular interval, regular duration in between each beat, okay? That's what we feel as a pulse, okay? So metro is actually shorthand for metronome, okay? So if you, want to, if you can use that as a mnemonic device to remember the name metro, okay? It's effectively, it, it, it allows you to do metronomic things in your patch to cause things to happen at reg regular intervals, okay? So go ahead, and if you haven't completed the word metro, 
And then, uh, as we were pointing out here, right, space and then an argument. Okay, so go ahead and after the word metro, hit space. And you should see, even before you start typing something, it's going to tell you what arguments this object takes. Okay, so very handy in terms of this, this little menu that pops up at the bottom will tell you a lot about what you're doing when you build patches and give you hints as far as how to complete things. Okay, um, so the argument is the interval. Okay, we happen to be in this patch that I showed you on the slide, we're going to be actually. Uh, we're pulling the state of the mouse, okay? We probably want to do that at a fairly regular interval if we want to get a consistent feel of the mouse changing things, okay? And that's why I had the number 10 here, okay? Uh, it tells you the interval. It, what it doesn't tell you in this menu is the unit of measurement, okay? Just, uh, I don't know, I, from what you know about how quickly you move the mouse around on the screen, what unit of measurement do you think this is? 10 what? This is the interactive part of class. So. Milliseconds. milliseconds, yeah. Why do you guess milliseconds? Uh, 10 is relatively low number, so you want to check the mouse state very quickly. Yeah. And so 10 milliseconds actually translates to about 100 times a second. Okay, so 100 times a second, you're taking the, the mouse data. I mean, think about how you how quickly you move the mouse across the screen. It's usually less than a second from the left side to the right side, correct? So you want to know if that changes, so therefore you want to do that very regularly. If, if you metronomically do that every 10 milliseconds, you're actually pulling the state 100 times in one second, okay? So I'm going to hit return, okay? That will get rid of the menu, that will finalize the object, and you'll see... Um, inlets and outlets at the top and the bottom, okay, respectively. So just to show you, uh, if I were to misspell this, okay, and then hit return, note that when I have a bogus object name, I don't get inlets and outlets, okay? So in addition to the menu, it's uh, another way that Max tells you, hey, something is going on wrong here. And if I go over to my Max window, I get a message there's those messages from Max, right? Metrum, no such object, okay? Uh, why in a, in a programming environment would we want to have a, a window where messages are posted rather than pop-up menus all the time? Cleaner, cleaner right? Yeah, uh, that's the primary reason, cleaner. Uh, it's going to prevent us from cluttering up the desktop, okay, with a bunch of pop-up menus, especially in the early days where you're learning the names of objects and you might be typing things in wrong and errors might be occurring, right? One could imagine a patch, especially, well, let's take, for example, the fact that there's, uh, I'm trying to pull the mouse state 100 times a second. Can you imagine 100 uh, pop-up menus popping up every second versus 100 messages just being posted to this window, okay? It's a lot cleaner to be posting messages in, the win in this max window, okay? So that's the primary reason for that, okay? So look at that. We're one object in, and I've already taught you like five or six different concepts, okay? You're, you're learning so much about Max already. Can you stand it? No? How's your, is it, this is 1 o'clock, right? This is not an 8.30 class, right, that Dylan was talking about, right? Okay. We're going to liven it up here. Okay, so we've got a metro here. Uh, if it's going to output the word... Bang. Uh, to prove this to you, let's create another object. Uh, you can either click and drag if that if you're more comfortable with that, if you're more of a, a, a user interface, WYSIWYG kind of person. The other thing to, to know, if you're someone that likes the keyboard, if you just simply hover your mouse in a location and you press the N key, it's going to create a new object at that location. Okay? For some of you, that's going to be faster than clicking and clicking and clicking, okay? So if you're a keyboard person, N will get you a new object. Uh, and let's type in the word print. What's the description of print? Yep, yep. Print any message in the max window. Yeah, okay. So any message that comes in is going to get printed to that max window that we've been talking about, okay? So go ahead and click outside or hit return. If we, we now need to make a connection, okay? Metro is going to output bangs, print, takes in any message and prints it to the max window. So if we make a connection here, and this is where you need to use your mouse, okay, if you click on the outlet, okay, and then click 
on the inlet, it should make a connection. Now, did anybody have problems with that? No? Okay. There's, there's one behavior here that I like to point out, and that is whether you have uh, what are called yeah, segmented patch cords. Okay. Um, so up in the options menu at the top, okay, you see this option for segmented patch cords. Does everybody have that checked or no? No? Okay. So I have it checked because I, I personally like it checked by default. Okay. What that allows me to do, so let me show you, when I don't have it, when I have it checked, I can click and let go and it, the patch cord stays stuck to my mouse cursor. So as I move around, even though I'm not holding the mouse, I can keep it stuck. Especially if you're on a laptop with a trackpad, that can be handy because then you don't have to press and hold as you move across the screen. So, uh, and the other thing that it lets me do, I can do kind of pretty configurations here, okay? I can, every time I click, it creates a new segment in the patch cord, okay? Um, that can sometimes be handy for organizing your patch. Not in these really simple, basic five object patches, but as your, object, as your patches grow in complexity, being able to click around something just so you can kind of see the flow of information is handy, okay? It doesn't change the functionality of it. It's just a visual cue for you to be able to see the path that the information is traveling, okay? Uh, if you've got a sticky patch cord and it, you want to get it unstuck from your uh, mouse cursor, you just simply command click and it goes away, okay? As opposed to when I uncheck the segmented patch cords, what happens is when I click, I have to actually click and, let's see, I have to click and hold, and the moment I let go, it goes away, okay? So that's just a subtle difference. Uh, most Max patchers, Max users have their, um, have their preferences. Mine is that segmented patch cords is checked. Um, in a lab of uh, 25 or 20 some odd machines, uh, you're probably going to find that that's behavior is going to change from machine to machine as people check or uncheck their preference. Okay, so we're we can output a bang every 10 seconds, but we need to turn this on. Okay, um, this gives us a, an important uh, distinction. Let's see. Let's let's create an on-off switch first. So that right here, there's a toggle object in the Explorer. Okay, so you want to click and drag that over to your patch. Let me see if I can do it this way. No. Okay, here. And that, basically, you see the description here, output one or zero when toggle is, I've, I've got zoomed in too far. Toggle is set, okay? So if I click and drag and connect this to my metro, okay, that now gives me an on-off switch for my metronome that's gonna bang every 10 milliseconds, okay? So this gives us, this tells me, uh, um, let me think. Next thing you wanna do, the, before we move any further, let's go ahead and lock the patch. So down here in the lower cor lower left-hand corner, go ahead and lock the patch. When it's unlocked, you can edit it. When it's locked, it's ready for use, okay? Um, let's see, your patch can remain in use while it's unlocked. So your, your patch can actually be running and you can unlock it and keep editing it, okay? That's a little dangerous at the beginning as you're getting used to Max, but it can be handy if that it can actually be making sound, doing things while you're editing it and reprogramming it, okay? Um, but just be aware that, that there, there is no limitation that says when you unlock the patch, it automatically stops running. It's going to keep running, okay? So lock it. We zoom in, okay? So why isn't this outputting a bang to the Max window every 10 milliseconds? Well, patch cords... I think the, the key thing to understand here, patch cords are the potential for interaction. They do not necessarily mean that interaction is happening constantly all the time. Okay, so there's a potential for interaction between the output of Metro and the inlet of print, but that doesn't mean messages are actually passing here. It's Think of it as a pathway where messages can go, not that messages are going in that direction. Okay, that's a key thing to understand when you're looking at this visual representation, okay? Same thing with this toggle, which is a basically an on-off switch. We can toggle this metro on and off, but it's not going to be doing anything until I actually click this. So if you click this toggle switch, you should see your max window start to fill up with a bunch of messages, yes? Did we get tons of bangs in the window? 
couple hundred of them. You don't have to leave it on for very long for it to fill up, okay? Because as we mentioned, every 10 milliseconds it's outputting a bang, okay? That's the message that's being sent right here out the metro into print. Print's job is then when it receives the message to put it in the max window. Make sense? Any questions so far? Okay. If we wanted to be, I don't know, have parity with other languages that you would learn, we, we could send a message, hello world, and we could have it print hello world 100 times a second, basically, because that's a usual fundamental beginning programming assignment in programming classes. Yes, right, Michael? Yeah, okay. Um, let's skip over that for now. Let's just stick with uh, bangs, okay? So we've got our metro. We've got an on-off. We're printing it, okay? We don't want to print it. We want to do something else with it. So flipping back over to my uh, slide here, we're going to actually uh, use the mouse state object, okay? It's a compound word, right? Mouse and state. What do you think it does just from the name of it? Oh, that's not what I want. Yeah, information about the mouse, okay? So hide that. Okay, so go ahead and create a new object, mouse state. Whoa, it's got one inlet and it's got one, two, three, four, five outlets, okay? Something else that you know, will notice about mouse is as you hover over things, you get a description about what that outlet or inlet does, okay? So if you're ever confused about what information is going to come out of an outlet, mouse, uh, Max provides you with information uh, about each outlet, okay? So you can see the kinds of information you get. You, you can get button up and down, uh, horizontal position, vertical position, great. D that's really all we, we need. You can also get delta. What's delta for those people that don't know? How is delta used in <clears throat> scientific contexts? It's been a long time since somebody, some of you taken physics. Delta means what? Rate of change. change. Rate of change, yeah. So it's the amount of change that happens in the mouse horizontally and vertically, okay? But if you hover over the inlet, you'll see why we would actually have these things interact with each other. Bang triggers mouse location reports. So mouse state doesn't do anything by itself. It just sits there idle. But when it receives a bang, it's going to output what it knows about the mouse state at that point, okay? Metro just happens to output bangs, so therefore, these objects like each other. So if we go ahead and create a connection between them, okay, we now will get reports about what the mouse is doing every 10 milliseconds when the metro is on. Okay. Now, I can turn this on at this point, but it's not going to help me very much, right? Because it mouse state is doing its thing, but there's nothing that mouse state is connected to for me to actually see what information is coming out of it. Yes? Okay. So the question then becomes, how do we want to see this information? Okay, we could print it to the max window. That might be that might work. Um, it might not be the cleanest solution. I would like to actually stay in the patcher. I'd like to build this as a little uh, self-contained patch GUI thing. Okay, so I'm gonna come over here to the Explorer, and you'll see there's two options. There's one that's called number, and there's one that's called flow num. Okay. The differences between these are one's an integer, one's a floating point number, okay? And the way you tell the difference is where the little dot is, whether there's a dot or not. What's the difference between an integer and a floating point number? Robert, I know you know this. You took intro to computing with me this summer. Um, uh, floating point number and a decimal. Yeah. Floating point has a decimal and some fractional component after the decimal. As opposed to the number is an integer, therefore it's only going to be whole numbers, okay? Mouse state happens to output whole numbers, but we, for our purposes, let's go ahead and go with floating point, float num, flow num, okay. And I can click and drag these from the palette, or I can also, here's another, here's a advanced user, okay. If, if it's a user interface object, uh, meaning that it has some sort of click and drag component to it, like a toggle, like a flow num, like a number, okay. I can actually get it by doing the same new new object, and as long as I type in the name of it, it will convert it to the user interface object. Okay, 
So this is where it's handy, to, if you're a keyboard type of person, it's handy to start learning the names of objects because instead of just clicking and dragging them from the palette because you'll be able to stay right on the keyboard, hit N, and then type in flow num, or type in number, and you'll see it's display and output a number, okay? And you, can, you should be able to see the difference here. I was already zoomed in. One has a dot, the other one doesn't have a dot, okay? Um, that, I, I predict that will be a recurring theme, especially as we move into audio. There will be a lot of times when you want to use a floating point, but you'll accidentally use an integer and it will cause problems with your sound patch, okay? Um, so if I start to sound like a broken record by the end of the semester, I apologize, but it's a common, it's a common mistake, one that I, I make at, at least a couple times a, a month, okay? Uh, so we want to get the horizontal and vertical information. So go ahead and connect the horizontal and vertical outlets to your flow num objects. You have to do that in the unlocked state. If you're having trouble patching, first thing you should check is this lock down here at the bottom, okay? So if you, like in this case, if I lock the patch, and then I zoom, let me see, oh, I just unlocked it. Zoom in. If I click and drag now, I'm not going to be able to make those connections. Okay, so the first thing to check is always your uh, your lock state. Okay, and if if going to the bottom left hand corner of the screen of the uh, window is too far for you, if you just command click in any of the white space, it it locks and unlocks the patch for you. Okay, again shortcuts. Okay, so now that we've got the horizontal and vertical state connected here. Go ahead and uh, lock your patch, turn it on, and as you move the mouse around the screen, you should see real-time horizontal and vertical information. Yay. Is that working for everybody? Okay. Uh, just to confirm that we see what's going on here, let me do this. To reiterate the, the whole interval thing, right? We're doing it every 10 milliseconds. If I instead put every 1,000 milliseconds, which is equal to one second, watch what happens. See the lag in the numbers? Okay, that might work for your application, but it's not likely. It's more likely that if you're building an expressive instrument, you want something that's reactive in real time to the input device. In this case, a mouse. Okay. So 10 milliseconds is probably what you want. Ooh, ooh, hey, zoom out, okay. So I can connect a number box, so the other thing here is I can connect a number box to this other inlet and I can control the rate, okay, of the updates. Great, so I've got horizontal and vertical information, okay. Um, I don't know, if I'm working with this, I might be looking at this patch and forget to myself, is the one on the left the horizontal or the one on the right the horizontal? And I don't want, it's, a couple of clicks to unlock the patch, then float over the outlet and see, oh wait, okay, that one's horizontal, the one on the left is horizontal, that's the one I want to work with, okay? So comments are an easy way for you to add information to your patch, okay? Over here in the Explorer, you'll notice there's a comment box. I can easily drop in a comment and I can say vertical, and I probably just spelled that, yeah. And then I can drop in another comment box over here, and I can say horizontal. Okay. Now you'll notice these comment boxes come with a a ready-made set width that is probably too long for whatever word you're putting in there. If you're putting in a brief description, okay. Uh, keystroke for that is Apple or Command J will shorten it. It will tighten up the box to fit whatever text is in it. Okay, so that's also, let me think here, yeah, fix width is the option for that, okay. So that's, that's handy because now when I'm locking the patch and I'm looking at the numbers coming in, I can tell a little bit more about what's going on, okay. Uh, okay, so back to my example patch. We want to actually connect that to making sound. Remember, I mentioned on Thursday the difference in the way the patch cords are, are colored on the screen, right? Who can 
who remembers what that difference is and what, what that means when they're fuzzy patch chords versus just a gray line? For audio, yeah. Okay, good. Monica? Yeah, so the gray ones are con conveying max messages is typically how it's expressed. They're just simply messages that are cued at um, as needed. Okay, you can think of them as messages that are being passed between those objects. But then once we hit the cycle object here, and once we hit this multiply tilde object here, we're now dealing with audio. So there's actually audio flowing down this patch cord, and there's audio flowing down these patch cords out to this speaker icon. Okay. Um, I know I mentioned in the gray patch cords, it's the potential for connection. Okay. There's not necessarily a message actually being passed. It's, it's a pathway that the message can travel. That's different for audio. When you have an audio connection and audio is on, audio is always being passed down those connections. Why would that be the case? Once you turn on audio, do you want it to stop rendering audio once audio is on? Yeah, you actually need a constant flow of information. And all of you have taken some manner of audio class before this, right? 44,100 samples per second. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Okay. The sampling rate for CD quality audio. Uh, what Max and MSP is doing here is it's sending 44,100 samples per second down those patch cords in order to keep your audio running. Okay. Uh, it actually can be increased if you're using a, a sound card that has a higher sampling rate. So you can run it at 48, you can run it at 96 if you want to, you know, whatever high quality audio you want to render. Okay. But uh, at the base, at a base level, if you're just using the included sound card, or if you're using the the fast track as your output, um, it will probably be operating at 44,100 samples per second. Okay, that's how many numbers it's spitting down the pipe. Okay, in order to keep your audio rendering. Okay, so uh, let's start with the cycle object. Okay, so go ahead and create a new object again, and I'm going to keep using the. Okay. So before you hit enter, you may notice something here. There's two different objects. Cycle without a tilde. So this, this little squiggly line, in case you're looking for it on your keyboard, it's next to the one if you shift and then click that, that accent key that's next to the one on your keyboard. That's where you get the tilde. Okay. If an object is responsible for dealing with sound, it's going to have a tilde at the end of it. If it doesn't deal with sound, it doesn't have a tilde at the end of it. Okay, I, I should be more specific. Audio, if it's, a, it's responsible for rendering audio, it will be followed by a tilde. Okay, so you'll see here in this example, there's actually two cycle objects out there. One of which is a round robin messages to outlets. That's a max object, it just deals with messages. The other one is a sinusoidal oscillator. Okay, or a sine wave generator, to put it in even... Uh, I guess, less esoteric uh, terminology, okay? It generates a sine wave, okay, which is useful. Um, or, it, yeah, to be even, to be totally specific, it's actually a cosine generator, but cosines and sines sound the same. They're just 90 degrees out of phase with one another. Don't worry about it just yet. If you're in the audit additive synthesis group for research, you'll, you'll deal with cosines versus sines and the fact that they're 90 degrees out of phase with each other. Anyway, so... Uh, okay, my point being, in uh, sound generation, okay, we are typically dealing with the cycle tilde object, not the cycle no tilde object, okay? We actually want to generate a sine tone, okay? But it's a very common uh, error to do this, to say cycle, forget the tilde, and then say 550, because the argument for cycle tilde is hertz, okay? That's a lot of outlets, as you can see. Let's zoom back out. And Max actually is kind of helpful in this regard, because if you zoom in on it, say, it actually says 550 is a lot of outlets. Perhaps you are trying to make an oscillator, OK? So it, it's, the, the programmers are very polite, too, OK? So they're, they're, they're good chaps, OK? Um, so all that to say, make sure you don't forget the tilde. OK, I'm going to go ahead and put the tilde on here. And I'm going to connect it to the horizontal mouse state. Okay. 
So now, I guess a point that I should make here. Mouse state is reporting what? What's, what's the unit of measurement on that horizontal box that we labeled? No, well, it's it's position, right? So what's the unit of measurement on position on the screen? Pixels, right? Okay. So I'm 403 pixels from the left-hand side of the screen, okay? But it doesn't have a unit of measurement attached to that number. It It's implied because it's coming out of the mouse state, but all that mouse state reports is 403 pixels, okay, implied. Cycle... It's generating a sine wave. It doesn't care about pixels, right? But it does, if you float over it, want, what does it say? Frequency, okay? So in Max, one of the nice things about Max and working in Max is that when you're passing these numbers back and forth, it makes it very easy to map something from one unit to another. Okay, what the mouse state reports as pixels can very easily be read or input into the inlet as hertz for the cycle object. Okay, max, and I don't get any errors in here because all this is doing is giving me a number and that goes directly into the cycle. Okay, so I promised you we'd make some noise. Let's make some noise. So scroll down to your explorer here. You'll see there's an easy DAC is what it's called. It has a speaker icon. I hope, hopefully you can imagine what this does. Okay, the fact that it has a speaker icon. Okay, I drop that in my patch. Okay, it has two inlets, and you notice that it's labeled channel one and channel two. Who knows about uh, channel numbering? Uh, what, how that corresponds to left and right? Yeah. It's channel one left and channel two right. Yeah, channel one is left, channel two is right. It should be, I'd say, in ninety-nine percent of the cases, basically. Okay, that it's convention that odd numbers are left ch channels, even numbers are right channels. Okay, so if I want to hear this out of both speakers, the way that I connect this is by simply clicking and connecting the outlet of my sine wave into both channels. Okay. Um, and I will start to hear my sine wave. Now, I'm not hearing it right now, but I haven't turned on audio, okay? Now, I can do, well, let's see, I'll go ahead and lock the patch. If I turn this on, uh, okay, I'm getting a nice tone with it. If I turn on the Metro now, That's not my patch. Somebody else is. Is somebody else? No, it's his. Okay. So I could probably. Okay. So I get. I can turn on audio here, but then I also have to turn on mouse mouse data here to save myself a step. Okay. It just so happens that the Easy Deck accepts ones and zeros to turn itself on and off, on and off. So if I just do this, now I have one on switch. Right. And so the key thing to understand here, uh, let's uh, uh, zoom out here, okay. Inlets and outlets do not have to have a one-to-one -one relationship, okay. Just because you connected an outlet to one inlet doesn't mean you can't then connect that outlet to another inlet, to another inlet, to another inlet, okay? The message coming out of that outlet can actually go to multiple places. In this case, we have an on-off switch. We want to both turn on our mouse feed and turn on audio at the same time. So why not connect it to the audio and turn it on, okay? Make sense? So is everybody able to get tone out of theirs? Go ahead and try it out. If you're not hearing audio, If you're not hearing audio, check this with me. If you go to Options, Audio Status, so the Options menu, Audio Status, 
you should see there's an option that says driver, and yours might have something about the fast track. The fast track is that little silver box, and it has no speaker of its own. It only works off of headphones, okay? For our purposes today, go ahead and flip it over to core audio or built-in, one of those two options, and it should start sending it out to the speaker so that when you turn your patch back on, you'll hear it. I want to make sure everybody's getting audio out of their speaker at this point. Cool, everybody's got sound. Okay, so we're controlling frequency, right? Uh, we probably would like to control another aspect of this. Let's uh, time for a sec time out for a second. Okay, we might want to also control the level of this, right? Because you notice as you move the mouse around, you're just controlling the frequency of the of the sine wave. You're not actually controlling the the amplitude or the level of the sound, the the intensity of the sound wave. Okay. So we have the nice thing about um, uh, the mouse, right, is we have two dimensions, right? We, we've assigned the horizontal dimension to frequency, so let's now assign the vertical dimension to amplitude or level or intensity, okay? So go ahead and in your patch, okay, we need to do a couple different things. One, we're going to need a new object here, and that's the multiply tilde. So I had to actually shift 8 gets me to asterisk. Okay, asterisk in pr programming terms is used for multiplying. Tilde then tells me that it's an audio object. It, it handles audio, okay. We're going to multiply this sine wave signal by something in order to control it, okay, in order to control its intensity, okay. Multiplication gets connected with uh, changes in intensity, okay. And it, if you think about it, it makes sense. If you multiply, we, we, we easily talk about things as being half as loud or a third as loud, basically, Essentially, what you're doing at that point is you're multiplying by a half, multiplying by a third, okay? So, you need to actually repatch this a little bit. So, if you haven't unlocked your patch, a um, couple things you can do. You can either delete the cable after you, you click on it, a highlight, and you can delete it and then repatch it. Or, something that's uh, newer in this uh, Max 6, you notice that there's a green and a red handle. If you click on one end, you can actually remove it from the object and move it to where you want to put it. Okay. So make sure, take, take the patch cord away from the cycle object and move it over to the multiply tilde object. Okay. Um, and then take the output from the cycle object and feed it into the multiply tilde object. Okay. Now we can take the vertical and connect its outlet to the other side. So effectively what we're doing is we're multiplying this sine wave by the vertical pixels. Okay, let's just do that for starters and I'll, once you've got that configuration, um, I've got it patched into one channel. Uh, let's see, do I have a output for this speaker up here. I can be louder than all of you if I just plug in. Ha ha ha. Okay. So if I lock the patch, let me zoom out. Everybody should get this behavior, right? And if you've got this configuration, go ahead and turn it on and play around with the mouse. Tell me what you think of the results. Is it an intuitive interface? Does it make sense the way you're moving the mouse and the way the sound is reacting? Any opinions forming? I, I've told you that we're controlling volume. How can, can you get it to actually be quieter or louder as you're moving the mouse around? Yeah. Could you move it slower? What now? Could you move it slower? You could move it slower, okay. That would be one way to do it, but just uh, I'm more interested in what it, 
discover for yourself how moving the vertical and, and horizontal position actually affects the, the, the frequency and the, the, the volume, the intensity of the sound. I move it over to the top of the screen. It says zero vertical. There's no output. Ah, okay. So Eric's discovered what I was hoping you guys would figure out, right? The idea that as you move to the top of the screen, right, that's when it actually disappears. Okay, let's talk about that from an interface design standpoint. Is that intuitive for a user that the top of the screen is quietest, but then it gets louder from there, and I actually don't have to move it very far before it's at maximum intensity? What is that? Uh, what's what's your opinion of that interface design wise? When you make more sense for it to like get louder. The loudest it could be is at the bottom instead of like moving it like half an inch. And ah, okay. So there's a problem with scaling, right? The idea that I've only got because I'm multiplying it by pixels, right? Okay. Pixels worked fine when we were dealing with frequency because we're going from zero hertz to 1,028 hertz. Okay, that's roughly where is that at on the keyboard? That's probably two octaves from the top of the keyboard, an octave and a half from the top of the keyboard, if you're thinking about a full 88 key piano, okay? Um, that works fine in terms of hertz, but when we're talking about intensity, right, zero being at the top, and then by the time I get to about 30, I, I've topped out, right? I can't get, it, it, it basically feels the same after that. Let me see, I turned it down here. Although I hear, you hear that distortion in the sound? Okay, there's a little bit of distortion in there. That's because we're multiplying this by something that's far too big a range for what we actually need to do, okay? I mentioned something being half as loud, being a third as loud, okay? Typically when we're scaling amplitude, we scale by numbers between zero and one not 0 and 1,024, okay? So we're off by a factor of 1,024, okay? The question is, how are we going to get it back in line, okay? Uh, we can do a couple different things. One, we can divide by a certain number, um, and if you're good at algebra and those sorts of things, you can figure out the fact that, okay, I want it to be from 0 to 1. It actually is from 0 to 120, uh, 1,024, so I need to actually multiply by this or divide by that and get it in the range that I want, okay? If you're someone that is scared by that process, okay, Max is here to help you, okay? You can actually delete this patch cord, okay? And we're going to add an object here called scale, okay? And of the objects that we've studied today, scale is probably the one that you might want to go ahead and open the help patch for. How do we get the help patch open for this object? Do you need to do one with a tilde? Not a tilde, no. Scale without a tilde. How do we get the help patch for this object or any object? There's a couple different ways, but anybody know? The help patch. The help patch. Uh, the, like, help, option that, click? Option click, yes. So while it's unlocked, option click on the object, it's going to open up a separate patch for you that tells you all about this object. Whatever object you clicked on, option click on it, it opens the help patch, it's going to tell you all about it. Look, take 30 seconds, look at this help patch and tell me what this object does. I'll watch the clock and then I'll pick on somebody. Pick on somebody. Michael, tell me what this object does. Um, the scale object, it maps the value of the string to other values. So say you have a value range from 0 to 1,440. Mm -hmm. You can map it to just 0 and 1, like a floating point number. OK. And, and looking at the arguments for this patch, uh, or this object, excuse me, uh, Monica, do you see the format for the arguments that go into the scale object? Uh huh.
Okay, yeah, so the exponential actually lets you do a non-linear mapping, okay, which is sometimes handy. But you actually only need the first four, okay? You need to know the highest and the lowest value of your input, and you need to know the highest and the lowest output uh, value of the output that you want. And it does the math for you to figure it out, okay? This is a very handy object, especially in this world where we're mapping things like pixels to amplitude, okay? Or for that matter, MIDI to whatever, okay? So uh, we already said, let's see, uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this help patch, okay? If you move, this is where the number box is helpful, right? I move it to the top, I see zero. I move it to the bottom, I see 1,024. So I know my input is from zero to 1,024, okay? And yes, it does make a difference whether you have the decimal place or not. Okay, if you add the decimals, uh, it will do floating point math. If you leave them off, it will do integer math, which might not give you what you want. Okay, so in this case, go ahead and put zero point and then space one uh, ten twenty four point space. Okay, and I told you we want it to output between zero and one is a good range for amplitude. Okay, so it's going to take numbers that are within this first range and it's going to map them to this second range. Okay, So if I now take the output from my vertical connected to the scale object, take the output from the scale object and connect it to my multiplier, Okay, I can also, if I want to watch the numbers on how it's changing, okay, I can see the output if I just add another float num there. Uh, what I did there, I, this is a, a kind of, uh, I guess a max user trick basically. Rather than go over to the palette over here, if I know I want another copy of an object that's already in my patch, if I just simply option click drag, it'll duplicate it for me. Ever see that? Okay, sometimes that's, uh, I'll, I'll put it this way, oftentimes that is faster than going over to the palette, creating a new object, typing in the name, that sort of thing, okay? So that's the reason I did that, okay? So now let me turn my volume up. So there's a couple of things here. Any other, any couple of things I'm noticing that I might want to change, but uh, anything you guys? Yeah. I think the higher we go, it should be the louder. Ah, yeah. So we want to flip the range, right? Okay. Turn it down. That's easy enough. If we just simply invert the range on the scale object. So order matters here, okay? The order of my arguments matters. If I take a range that's from low to high and I want to flip it to go from high to low, it'll take care of that for me. Okay? Lovely. So I've got a nice patch to sonify my mousing experience, okay? You can let this run on your uh, uh, computer while you're typing your next paper or doing your next assignment, right? And you can just listen to the sign tones change as you move the mouse around the screen. I don't know. It's a very simple patch, yes, okay? Uh, uh, but it, hopefully you see some possibilities here, yes, of, of the kinds of things we can do with Max. Uh, we're taking mouse information and we're mapping it to sound, okay? These kind of mappings are very easy to do in Max, okay? Um, I say, I'll point out one other thing here. You'll, you might notice some little zipper noise there. Let's see if I can get it to do it. You ever hear that crunchiness? Okay, that's actually because these steps are a little too far apart, these uh, the floating points. So even though we've reduced it down to a floating point range between zero and one, actually the step between zero or uh, five three six and five three eight is audible enough for us to hear it at some points. Okay, so there's other things we can do with scaling the information to smooth it so that it changes more fluidly. Okay, um, it's not that it, it's the it's because the difference is happening every 10 milliseconds that it's 
we can actually hear that transition over it when it suddenly happens 10 milliseconds later. Okay, that's what's causing that zipper noise. But we'll get into smoothing later as we get into your projects. Okay, any questions about this patch? Is it helpful to see Max in action doing something, making some sound? Okay. Um, let me flip back over to my slides because I do have some slides and I now have 15 minutes to get through them. Challenge. Okay. Some of them I already showed you before. Okay. So, I, but I wanted you to kind of get the feel for programming in Max before we get back into this. Okay. Uh, so, as I mentioned last time, graphical programming environment, Cycling 74. Okay. Easy connections to other systems, but also easy connections in between things. Okay. Terms that I introduced last time. Okay. Patcher. What's a patcher? Yeah, the, the, the whole program, right? The little program that we just developed, that's a patcher, okay? Go, yeah, you can go ahead and hit save. You just cre sa created your first max patcher. Congratulations, okay? Um, objects. How do I tell an object from, let's see. Ah, I didn't get into messages. I'll come back to that, though. Let's do it. Well, let me, yeah, let me show you that real quick. Oh, I don't want to zoom on that. That's dumb here. Let me flip back over, okay. So if instead of, I'll just show you messages real quick, okay? Um, I can get messages with the M key. So if I want to be able to do, say something to generate sign tones real quickly. Ah, I want to do 880 and 440, okay? If I connect these messages ah, to my number box here, Okay, lock the patch and turn it on. Okay. Okay. So number boxes have a discrete value to them. When you click on, excuse me, uh, message boxes have a discrete value to them. When you click on that message box, it sends its message on down the chain, whatever it's connected to. Okay. So if you know you want specific values, message boxes are, are a good way to do that. Okay. Rather than dynamic values like we have coming out of the mouse state, yeah. So it's like constant. Yeah, you can think of them as constants. Yeah, but uh, again, the patch cord is a potential for connection, not a not a constant connection. So it's not sending 220, 440, and 880 are not being sent consistently. It's not until I click on them that the message is actually sent. Yeah. Oh, uh, when you say you're programming something that you could use on a, like a keyboard, would you have to like link each key on the keyboard to one of those? to generate noise or is there another way to do that where you can do like there is another way to do that yeah we'll talk about MIDI on Thursday okay uh, so heads up if you've got a MIDI device that you want to bring in here and plug in uh, via, if it has a USB connection I can't promise you that we'll have we have one MIDI to USB connect uh, box up here and I don't think the drivers installed on any of these machines but uh, if you've got one that has a USB connection, you might want to bring it into class on Thursdays because you can we can actually get you'll actually see the data, the raw data coming out of it, and how we can map it to sound. Okay, uh, let me turn that off. Okay, so message boxes, um, patch cords, right? I've mentioned patch cords. I mentioned the visual difference between audio and Max patch cords. Uh, I've talked a little bit about signals, the fact that we're dealing with audio at CD quality sound. Okay, and bang, the fact that it means do it. Okay. I introduced this concept very briefly at the at the end, okay? But hopefully you see how this starts to apply in a max concept context, okay? There's the input, there's the object which then maps and transforms that input, and then it produces some sort of output, okay? Uh, max objects, I, I'm speaking specifically about objects that don't have the tilde at the end of them. They will almost always wait for some sort of input before they output anything, okay? For example, that mouse state object, well, before we connected the metro to it, it did nothing. It just sat there waiting for a bang to come in, okay? As soon as we turned on the metro and started hitting bang into it, it actually started outputting information from the, 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 the mouse state, okay? So at the object level, okay, we can talk about how a specific object maps or transforms information, okay? So there are objects available to you to do all sorts of math okay so if you want to do if you've got math homework to do you can actually program your max patch to to do help you with your math homework okay um, and I can take two number two messages here 
one at 12.75, one at 2.5. And if I click on these from right to left, okay, I'll get the result in that number box at the bottom, okay, because the plus object knows that when I receive an input from the right side and then the left side, I should then take those two numbers, add them together, and then produce the results. Make sense? All right, that's the function of the object. That's what it is assigned to do, okay? Um, but you see how the inputs and the outputs relate to each other. Most of you know how to do addition, right? So this is a common function, okay, okay. it's a joke, okay. Uh, let's think through it on a higher level, okay? Thursday, we're gonna bring it, if you've got MIDI de devices, I said go ahead and bring them in. We've got a handful of them here, you might, uh, uh, we'll have to t I need to probably test these out before Thursday, just make sure the driver is working and everything like that so we don't get bogged down trying to deal with driver issues. Um, but we can take MIDI input from a note in object, getting MIDI note information coming in, map that then to a sine wave, and here it's output as audio. Okay, So this, this idea of data flow works on a more macro level as well. Okay, Taking inputs, mapping them to some sort of uh, mapping them or transforming them in some way and then hearing the output in this case. Sometimes the output will be visual, sometimes the output will just be numbers, sometimes the output will be a little blinking light, okay? But we're basically taking inputs, mapping them to output, okay? Um, yeah, uh, a word of warning about inputs and outputs. It's very easy in Max to connect uh, inputs to outputs and to create a situation what is called a loop or an infinite loop. Okay, um, we didn't look at the bang button, but the bang button does nothing more than when it receives any input, it outputs a bang. Or if you click on it, it produces a bang. Okay, so when I take my bang button, number one, and I click here, okay, when it, when it gets clicked on, it produces a bang, right? So it sends a bang down the system. Well, bang button number two, when it receives a bang, it then sends a bang. That bang gets sent over to number three. Number three, it receives a bang, so therefore it's going to produce a bang. It gets sent over to number four. Receives a bang, therefore it produces a bang. It sends over to number five. Receives a bang, then produces a bang, so it sends back to number one. And you see the, the loop that is created here? Okay? So be careful of loop situations in Max. Okay? Uh, because I don't know if they're, well, in some respects they're easier to see in line coding, right? Because you can actually, this looks like a loop. Right? It's, a, it's got a circular pattern, so you can kind of imagine the data is flowing back in on itself. So in some ways it's easier to spot. Um, what happens when I click on my first bang button, Max will report, this is one of the few conditions where Max will actually pop up a window, okay? And it'll say something about a stack overflow, okay? Um, when that happens, go ahead and tell it okay. Uh, you might need to make some sort of edit to your patch. But in the edit menu, there's an option that's called resume, okay? Whenever a stack overflow condition occurs, Max basically just stops, basically, and it won't run anymore until you tell it to resume, okay? I tell you this because you're beginners and because you're more prone to develop a loop situation, okay? Uh, that's why I want you to know about this resume option, basically, because if this stack overflow pops up, your patch will quit working until you either A, shut down Max and restart, or you just go to the edit window and hit resume, okay? So just know that how to get out of a loops situation, okay? Um, data types, data types, okay. Um, we've already talked about integers and floating point numbers, yes? And that's all something, uh, how many of you have taken the intro programming class? Most of you. No, no, okay. So, um, data types, in, in the, the most basic sense, you're telling the computer what type of data um, and therefore how much memory to set aside for this piece of information, okay? That, the main thing the computer wants to know is how much memory do I need to set aside for this? Whatever you're gonna report to me, okay? Um, so, different data types take up different amounts of memory. Um, and integers take up fewer than floating points uh, generally. Uh, and then we have a few other data types that you need to know about in Max, okay? So I think I had this animated, yeah, sorry. Okay, we did integers, right? Okay, number five, there's no point, so therefore it's not a floating point number, it's an integer, okay? It's a whole number. 4.2, that's a floating point number. So when you hear me talk about 
ints or floats. Int is basically short for integer. Float is short for floating point. Okay. <clears throat> Max keeps track of this um, behind the scenes. And certain objects behave differently when you have them in integer mode versus floating point mode. Okay. Uh, the default for Max is integer mode in a lot of these non tilde objects. Okay. That catches a lot of people off guard because it's 2014. But you have to remember, Max is a program that has roots that are going back 30 years now to the mid 80s. Okay, and in the mid 80s, when we had computers with you know 256k of memory, it was important to save memory and therefore to put things in integer format whenever possible. Okay, because Max has how shall we put it? Uh, maintained backward compatibility to a fault, <laughs> okay? Uh, they have continued to make integer the default for a lot of objects, okay? Um, don't assume that an object is dealing with floating points unless you have explicitly told it, and we'll get into how to do that, okay? Uh, the next data type you should know about is what's called a list, okay? So if you hear Max, uh, if, you see, if you read something about accepting lists, transforming lists, it's talking about this. It's nothing more than a series of pieces of information separated by spaces, okay? So this is a list with five items in it. The first item is 56, the second item is 3.1, the third item is dude, the fourth item is 98, the last item is hike, okay? Um, but those can all be compacted together into one data type, a list, and can be passed around for various uh, max objects, okay? Uh, next up is a message, or uh, sometimes referred to as a symbol. Okay, so you'll see some documentation talking about this as a symbol. Uh, it's uh, any word or phrase that does not contain a space in it. Okay, if it only contains letters, Max is going to assume it's a message, not uh, a, a number, obviously. Um, so keep bear that in mind. Okay. Um, you, let's see, if you were to take this 4.2 and put an N at the end of it, Max would then assume that it's a message, not a number, okay? Um, and then bang. Bang is such a reserved word that it is, it is a data type unto its own, basically, okay? Because uh, it means do something, okay? Um, we'll be kind of coming back to these uh, time and time again, but if you can remember at least integer and floating point, and then we'll get into lists and messages uh, as we go along, okay? Um, we'll get into those, okay? Um, yeah, what, oh, so quick analysis. If you if encounter something new in Max, the questions you should be asking yourself, what inputs does it take? How does it transform those inputs? And what are the outputs, okay? I'd say nine out of ten problems that I encounter with beginning Max programmers is some misunderstanding about what one object is outputting and what another ob input object is expecting an input, and there's a mismatch there. If your if your object is expecting a floating point number and you're sending it lists, there's a reason it's misbehaving. Okay, it's because it's not getting what it expects. Okay, um, similar to the way we were we were mapping pixels to uh, amplitude and hertz. Um, Max is okay doing that, but it, the the values might be out of range. Okay, Max doesn't care about the ranges of values. It's just going to accept it as information. Okay, um, so you'll hear me kind of uh, in addition to talking about float, uh, the data types and thinking that through. You'll probably hear me come back to this idea several times in kind of helping you out with your projects. Okay, so about your projects with the three minutes we have left. Okay. We're going to be doing synthesis in MIDI. What does this mean? This means that you must use a MIDI input device, or I guess a MIDI output device, something that outputs MIDI to Max to control your synthesis patch. Okay? Um, you will be investigating specific synthesis techniques. Okay? And uh, in putting together your groups, I thought it'd be interesting to look at. So uh, in, in looking at the aggregate data of your, um, your, your little surveys that we did on last week, okay? Uh, this is where the average was of the class on each one of these dimensions, okay? Um, and it probably won't take you long in your groups to figure out who are the people that are stronger in coding, who are the people that are stronger in music, who are the people that are stronger in organization, those types of things. Uh, I did try to kind of mix you up in skill level so that you have at least one person who's 
stronger in each of those areas so that you can kind of play off of each other, okay? But in looking at the groups and looking at the topics that we need to cover, I did make the assessment that it would be better to have three groups as opposed to two groups as opposed to four groups. So three groups is what we ended up with, okay? We did lose one person from the first day. Uh, I'm not sure where one person is uh, today. So uh, he has been assigned to a group, okay, as you'll see. Um, but you kind of, if you think back to like where you rated yourself on these, you'll probably guess pretty quickly who is the more computer savvy people in the group, musically savvy, organizationally savvy people basically, and you should be able to play off each other's strengths. That's perfectly fine in a group dynamic, okay? So these are the group assignments. So Eric and Michael, raise your hands just so you, everybody knows, okay, okay. Leo and Colby, you're right next to each other here. Sorry, I've been calling you Eric, sorry, I've been saying the wrong name there. So, okay, so, uh, uh, and then Monica, Aiden's not here, Robert's over here, okay? Those are our group assignments for this first project, okay? You need to make a selection from this graph, okay? Uh, there happens to be four uh, quadrants. Uh, we have three groups, so I'm making the decision that we're going to take lookup tables off the table. Uh, I want uh, a group to be looking at spectral models, a group to be looking at modulation distortion, and a group to be looking at physical models of synthesis, okay? Um, and... To prove the point that you can program your max patch to do anything, I'm going to pr program a max patch to select which group goes first. So I'm going to use a new U menu object. I'm going to use a random number generator. And I've got three groups. So actually, I need three options. Uh, I need to bang it to get a selection, and then I'm going to need to see the output, so I'll put, ah, you know what, I don't need to print it to window, I can actually use a message box. Uh, this one, see, let's see, this one actually gives me the number chosen, I'm going to want the text chosen, and if I put it in the message box, I'll get a display. I then need to, ah, not that, highlight my menu, and if I go to the inspector, I can scroll down here and edit my menu items so that we have, let me say, Michael's group. I'll use shorthand here. Monica and Colby will be our shorthand for our group folks, okay? So I've got three options in my menu. I've got a random function here, and if I lock this patch, Monica's group is picking first. What would you like? We have three on three things on the board: spectral models, modulation distortion, physical models. We're in overtime, so modulation. modulation distortion. Okay, so Monica and Robert, you're doing modulation distortion. Next group is Michael's group. Spectral models, models, or physical models. Spectral. spectral models. Okay, that means you guys are doing physical models. Okay. Um, the next reading starts to break these down and explain some of these, but you will need to do some research on these topics, okay? We'll talk more about the requirements next time, but you should at least have a, a ballpark uh, area of where you're headed, okay? Any questions? You said to do two weeks from Thursday. Two weeks from Thursday, yes, okay? I'll be explaining more about MIDI next time in class, and then next week are a few topics to follow up on. But there should be at least two classes of Q&A where I'm just helping groups with their projects to develop them before giving their presentations in class, okay? We'll talk more about the presentation requirements next time as well. But at least you've got a topic to start looking into, okay? See you guys.